Genesis chapter 33, page 28. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming toward him with 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female slaves. He put the female slaves first, Leah and her sons next, Rachel and Joseph last. He himself went on ahead and bowed to the ground seven times until he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet him, hugged him, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Then they wept. When Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? He answered, The children God has graciously given your servant. Then female slaves and their children approached him and bowed down. Leah and her children also approached and bowed down. And then Joseph and Rachel approached and bowed down. So Esau said, what do you mean by this whole procession I met? To find favour with you, my lord, he answered. I have enough, my brother, Esau replied. Keep what you have. But Jacob said, no, please. If I have found favour with you, take this gift from my hand. For indeed, I have seen your face and it is like seeing God's face since you have accepted me. Please take my present that was brought to you because God has been gracious to me and I have everything I need. So Jacob urged him until he accepted. Then Esau said, let's move on. I'll go ahead of you. Jacob replied, my Lord knows that the children are weak (coughs) and I have nursing sheep and cattle. If they're driven hard for one day, the whole herd will die. Let my Lord go ahead of his servant. I'll continue on slowly at a pace suited to the livestock and the children until I come to my Lord at Seir. Esau said, let me leave some of my people with you. But he replied, why do that? Please indulge me, my Lord. On that day, Esau started on his way back to Seir. But Jacob went on to Sukkoth. He built a house for himself and stalls for his cattle. That's why the place was called Sukkoth. After Jacob came from Paddan Aram, he arrived safely at the Canaanite city of Shechem and camped in front of the city. He purchased a section of the field from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for for 100 quesitas, where he had pitched his tent. And he set up an altar there and called it God, the God of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. (coughs) Be to God. We're going to spend a bit of time in this passage as an outline there, and uh, if I move quickly, there might be a chance for questions at the end. Uh, unexpected endings always stay with us, whether they're good or bad. Uh, in a harmless form, I reckon we often remember the movies that have a twist right at the end. They're the ones we remember. Uh, one has always stayed with me. You'll be familiar with it, 1996, Bruce Willis, Tony Collette, Haley Joel Osment, does anyone know the movie? The Sixth Sense, great movie. Dated a little in the fashion, but still a great movie. The twist comes in the last two scenes. But it's such a twist that you then rethink the whole movie. You go through every scene looking at it from a different perspective because you now see the pattern. Genesis 33 is just like that except it moves forward as well as backwards. Here we have a pattern, a pattern of what seems like impossible grace that runs not only through God's people, but as a seam at the centre of God's heart. And we're going to spend time in that today. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for your word spoken as a revelation of your nature desire and plans. Thank you for your word written, the word that is living and active always. Thank you for your word incarnate, Jesus Christ, who lived, died and rose for our sins. Father, through your spoken, written and incarnate word runs your pattern of grace. Please help us to know it today. Amen. What a night. Uh, If you are unaware of the kind of night it was, read 
the section just beforehand. Uh, if you want to hear an explanation, listen to Phil's sermon from last week. It was a corker. What a night. The night has been a long time coming. Emotions have built. Jacob is coming home and he knows he must do business with his brother. His desire is to be reconciled to him and in plans for that he sends people ahead and they come back with a message. Esau's coming with 400 men. Esau's coming with his own private militia. Jacob is greatly afraid and distressed. Jacob then did what Jacob always did. He planned, didn't he? He schemed. He divided his camp. He sent gifts and offerings ahead to placate Esau. (coughs) He desperately wanted Esau's forgiveness. And he tried to achieve this by sending material gifts ahead. Jacob did what he always did. Jacob also did what we've never seen before. He dropped to his knees and prayed, didn't he? Remember that prayer from last week? Uh, It's an amazing prayer. It's a great motto. If you're always stuck for something to pray, turn to Jacob's prayer. It's a prayer where he admits his standing before God. He confesses who God is. He states very clearly God's grace that he did not deserve and his dependence upon God. That's something Jacob had never done before. And then Jacob did something that was highly unusual. He wrestled with God all night. If you look at the pattern there, it's almost akin to new birth. He recognises his own nature. I'm the deceiver. He's given a new name by God. You are the wrestler. He's told about the promises and the blessing and the nature that he's given. It's a summary of the previous two decades. A summary in a night of wrestling, a a summary of a period of time when Jacob went under the discipline of disappointment, a time when Jacob realised that he'd spent all of his life wrestling with God and the image bearers of God, a a time when Jacob realised the great promise of God. Look, I am with you. I'll watch over you wherever you go. I'll bring you back to this land, for I'll not leave you until I've done what I've promised you. What a night. What a night. And now Jacob is back in the land that he'd left. He's drained. He's tired. He's exhausted. He's limping. He's brought low. And then he looks up. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming toward him with 400 men. It's like a bad Western nightmare, isn't it? Can you imagine it? Your head is in your hands, your elbows are on your knees, and you look up, and there is Esau and his army. Jacob moves very quickly, doesn't he? As quickly as a limp, exhausted man can. He divides his camp, Bilhar and Zilpah, the two female slaves and their kids to Jacob, then Leah and her sons, then Rachel and Joseph. Jacob moves to the front, not quickly because he's limping, and then he limps in front of them and he bows seven times before he comes to the feet of Esau. I'm always wary of seeing metaphors where they don't belong, but I think we're meant to see something here, aren't we? The deceiver who is now the wrestler, who is limping towards his enemy, brought low by God, a humble approach. And then the response is completely unexpected. Esau ran to meet him, hugged him, threw his arms around him, kissed him, and then they wept. What an unexpected ending. What a moment of complete surprise. I don't think Jacob could have hoped for this moment in his wildest dreams, could he? I don't know what the look on his face was like. I don't know where his hands went as Esau ran towards him. It's a very tight description. Moses doesn't waste words here. Ran, hugged, threw, kissed, wept. It's succinct, isn't it? Our questions are there. We want to know what's happened to Esau. That's our natural response. As we're told nothing. 
Are we given hints a little later on? We don't know what's happened in his life for the last 20 years, uh, who he has met, uh, what he has achieved, why he is successful. He's obviously successful. He's obviously capable. He's obviously powerful. The promises given to him have started to germinate. But would you have scripted this? No, you wouldn't have. And Jacob recognises it for what it is, doesn't he? Uh, In all of his responses to Esau's questions, there is grace, isn't there? Uh, Esau looks up and he sees the tribe. We've got to get in our minds. This is not just two people movers of people. This is a massive encounter. It could have numbered hundreds. And Esau looks up and goes, where did you get these people from? Do you you notice the reply in verse 5? They are the gracious gift of God. I don't deserve them. As Esau says that he is sufficient and doesn't need what Jacob is generously giving him, do you notice what Jacob says? Can you imagine saying this? Seeing your face, Esau, is like looking on the face of God. He's just looked at the face of God all night, hasn't he, and wrestled with him? And do you notice that that's not a light thing because looking on Esau's face, just like seeing the face of God, has led to what in verse 10? To being accepted. To being reconciled to his brother who 20 years earlier swore murder and fratricide. And now he gives him a hug and he kisses him and they weep together. He didn't deserve it. His enemy gave him what he didn't deserve, kindness, hugs, kisses, weeping together. Just as God's grace had committed to the deceiver alone in the desert, just as God's grace had disciplined this man through disappointment, just as God's grace had transferred ownership from Laban to Jacob, just as God's grace had wrestled with Jacob overnight and spared him but changed him. So now God's grace is everywhere, isn't it? It's right the way through. Undeserved kindness at mercy at the moment when Esau should have cut his throat. That's grace. The enemy of Jacob gives him a hug with warmth, kindness, affection, emotion. It leads to weeping. It leads to change. Look there in verse 11. Please take my present that was brought to you because God has been gracious to me and I I have everything I need. So Jacob urged him until he accepted. I've looked at the face of God. I've been accepted. Please take this. We don't get it in the English, but I'm told, and I don't know Hebrew, but I'm told that that word there for present or gift is unique. It's different to all the other words he's used to describe that. In fact, he's using a word from Genesis chapter 27, verse 35. Esau replied to his father, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. And so Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? For he's cheated me twice. He took my birthright. And look, he's now taken my blessing. That's the word. Do you know what Jacob's doing? He's giving back the blessing he stole. He's giving it all back to Esau. I've looked on the face of God. I've been accepted. I'm so sorry. What a marvellous display of grace. It's no mistake that when Jesus tells one of the most famous parables about grace, he actually seems to quote this incident, doesn't he? Remember Luke 15? Jesus is talking to the religious leaders. They would have known this passage. They're cranky at Jesus because he hangs out with sinners. Isn't that a good thing? And so he tells them three stories. And in the story of the prodigal son, we're familiar with it, aren't we? The younger son comes to his dad and says, hey, dad, I wish you were dead so I could have my inheritance. The dad gives him what he desires. The son goes and he wastes the money, squanders it on prostitutes and wild living. He's reduced to a pitiable state. He's a man who knows that he has no hope. He's sitting there in the paddock and he's desperate and he's desiring And he decides to go back. 
He says, I've sinned to his father. I'm going to admit my sin. I'm going to take a position as a worker. And listen to Luke chapter 15, verse 20. So he got up, went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. What did he do? He ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. Does that sound familiar? It sounds exactly like Genesis 33. Ran, threw, kissed. You can't miss what Jesus is saying, can you? That pattern of impossible grace, that's a thread through the Bible. God's people receiving from their enemy the forgiveness, the reconciliation they don't deserve. Jacob received it from Esau. The younger son received it from his father. The reconciliation is a pattern right throughout the Bible. So we get to Ephesians 2, that other reading, and you see that Paul goes, hey, do you guys understand what Jesus is, who you are and what you've become? By nature, you are God's enemies. You are dead, opposed to him, serving someone else under his right judgment. Because of God's nature, he has lavished upon you what you don't deserve, his one and only boy. Jesus lived, died and rose so that people might be forgiven, restored, reconciled to God. Jesus came running and hugged and kissed and wept and that completely changes you. It takes you from being an enemy of God to God's mob. It takes you from being objects of wrath to dinner guest at God's table. It takes you from being dead in your grave to being alive for good deeds. And the response, complete transformation, just like we saw in Jacob, living with a whole new boss, the pattern of impossible grace, the unexpected ending. It's the thread throughout the whole Bible. It's open to any human being. God says, I love you. Here is my boy. He dies for you. He is raised so you can be my people. You don't deserve it, but I'm lavishing it all upon you. Impossible grace. Do you know that grace? Have you actually experienced God himself running to you, grabbing you, hugging you, kissing you, weeping with you, saying, I forgive you because my boy lives, dies and rises for you? Do you know that grace? That grace is available for any person. Just read Jacob's history. And you'll realise it's available for any person. In fact, just after this sermon, we're going to sing a song about that, aren't we? Amazing Grace. A slave trader who dealt in the commerce of human lives meets this pattern of impossible grace and is completely changed. Have you met that grace? Let me tell you, if you do meet that astounding grace... It will not only transform you, it will change the way you look at the events of life, just like it always does. And so you will see, we will see what happens in a broken world through the lens of the impossible grace of God. It is astounding. The transformation is remarkable. Jacob returns the blessing. The prodigal son is welcome to the dinner table. The dead are made alive and brought to God's room. But did you notice the warning there in the prodigal son? Did you notice the last six verses? The older brother? Remember, Jesus is speaking to the religious authorities when he speaks that parable. He's not speaking to the sinners. And he's saying to the religious authorities, don't reject grace. Don't receive grace wrongly. The older brother, he rejects it, doesn't he? He grumbles about it. He brings up his good deeds in the face of it. He doubts the goodness behind it. 
And there's a warning there about impossible grace wrongly received. The same warning is in Genesis 33. Turn back with me to Genesis 33, page 28. Genesis 33, page 28. At Jacob's return to the land, I'm at point three on the add-on, Jacob's return to the land seems almost complete. He's come back from Padan Aram where he's lived with Laban. He's come back in a way that has brought him to be reconciled to his brother. He went across the river with a staff and he comes back with a tribe. He's returned with so much more than he left with as a wealthy community to the land that God promised him. Esau says, hey, come with me to see. Come with me to where I live. What does Jacob do? Jacob does what he always does. (laughs) He disengages with deception. There's more Jacob than Israel here, isn't there? Instead of being open and clear with his brother, Jacob is dodgy. There's nothing about Esau's conduct that should have raised alarm bells. Esau has been straight up and down. He's been the giver of impossible grace. And yet Jacob doesn't seem to trust him. Jacob dodges and parries and deceives again. I I think he's actually doing more than not trusting Esau. (laughs) I I think he's displaying a lack of trust that God can still be as gracious as he's just experienced. Surely he should trust him more than this. You see, the issue at this point isn't whether Esau is trustworthy. The issue here is whether Jacob is responding rightly to God's grace. You see, God had made him a promise in 28.15. I'll bring you back to this land, the land of Bethel, where he departed from, the land where he met God in that dream, the land where God committed to him, the land where he put up a pillar and said, this is where God is. God's been described as the God of Bethel in 31.13 and that God in 31.3 says, go back to that land. And in Genesis 35 verse 1, God is even blunter, get to Bethel. Jacob was commanded to go to Bethel by the God he met at Bethel. Jacob's return was to be to Bethel. Jacob has been reconciled to Esau and now he should obey his God and return to Bethel. On that day, Esau started on his way back to Seir, but Jacob went on to Sukkoth. He built a house for himself and stores for his cattle. That's why the place was called Sukkoth. After Jacob came from Padan Aram, he arrived safely at the Canaanite city of Shechem and camped in front of the city. He purchased a section of the field from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 quesitas, where he'd pitched his tent. And he set up an altar there and called it God, the God of Israel. He he doesn't obey God, does he? He settled for a place like Bethel, nearby Bethel, kind of like a, a, a suburb of Bethel. He's in Shechem, only 20 miles from Bethel. It's nearly Bethel, but it's not Bethel. It's nearly obedient, but it's not obedient. Can you have partial obedience? Can you have some obedience? Jacob receives impossible grace. (laughs) And he goes near obedience, but he doesn't quite get there, does he? Jacob receives impossible grace. And he should have gone to Bethel. But he goes to Shechem. And next week, we'll see what results, won't we? The wrong response to impossible grace is partial obedience, which is really just disobedience. The right response to impossible grace, grace rightly received by faith, is obedience. People who now know they aren't God, even though they wanted to be God, submitting to God who has given them impossible grace. The older brother rejected it, didn't he? Jacob distrusts God's ability to keep delivering. In the face of that wonderful reconciliation, he disobeys God. Now, on the one hand, there's a lot of reassurance there, isn't there? That sounds a lot like me. It might sound a little bit like you. We're just like Jacob, aren't we? And do you notice God persists? Isn't that good? On the other hand, there's a grave warning here too, isn't there? 
about how we receive grace, the grace of Jesus Christ, the grace of God that raises us from the grave and seats us at his table. Grace rightly received by faith leads to obedience of God's clear word. God's people, recipients of God's grace in Jesus Christ, obey God. To do anything else is to persevere under the illusion that we know better than God. Grace rightly received leads to obedience. So let me finish with the sister question to the one I asked earlier. Remember that one? Do you know this grace? Has this grace changed your perspective on life? Well, the sister question asks this. Is that grace rightly received shown in obedience to God's clear word? Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is good. Uh, I wrestle with it, Father. Uh, We all do, uh, which means we wrestle with you and you persist in your impossible grace. You display it fully in Jesus for our good. You give us your spirit to counsel us and change us and intercede for us. Father, forgive us uh, for when we are more Jacob than Israel. Keep working in us so that your image is more fully displayed through our lives. Bring us obedience to you in the face of your impossible grace. Amen. Any questions? Ebony. Ebony's asked a really good question. Jacob was sending ahead material gifts. Did that mean, because he wanted to be reconciled, and this was a way of trying to achieve that, does that mean Esau knew uh, he was sorry? We're not really told, are we? But certainly his reaction and the fact that Jacob looks at him as, I'm looking on the face of God, says Esau has already said in his heart and mind, I'm just going to hug this brother. Uh, So it's almost as if, man, why'd you even bother with the gifts? I was going to give you a hug anyway. So I don't think the gifts changed Esau. I think Esau came with a purpose, and the purpose was reconciliation, uh, and that was going to happen regardless, which is exactly why Jacob's expression that I've seen the face of God says, God's just the same with us. God, God is so stubborn and determined to show us grace that he sends his one and only son. We might shower all these. And God goes, why would you even bother with the gifts? I was going to give you a hug anyway. Does that answer your question? Yeah, good question, Ebony. Baxter. Yeah, yeah. (coughs) Why does he bring his private militia? Uh, I reckon a single bloke moving over 300 kilometres on his own. Yeah, if you've got your private army, take him with you. Um, I I think he took them for his own protection, not as violence against his brother, because he's travelling a long way in a really nasty part of the world. This is one of the areas where I don't think we realise how inhospitable that area is. And so he takes his army along with him, uh, kind of like you know, a lot of people travel today and they make sure they've got insurance. Do you need insurance? Uh, maybe not, but it's a wise, wise step. So, yeah, does that answer your question, Baxter? Yep. Oh, it, 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 Brent's just made a good point. It increases the grace. So I could use these 400 blokes, but I'm going to give you a hug. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah. Kim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kim asks a really good question. So he returns a blessing to Esau, um, uh, and, but the line still comes through Jacob, not Esau. Um, the blessing's already given, so it, it can't be undone. Uh, it's, it's a statement on the part of Jacob that we've been reconciled and I'm responding with a change of heart in my behaviour, the obedience. But it's interesting because I think there's a tangent here Can you imagine if you're a Jewish person and you read this and your enemy for all of your life is equated with God in this great moment of grace? It's kind of like 
the Good Samaritan, where the good guy isn't the Jew, the good guy is the Samaritan who everyone hates. So even there we're being shown that grace, grace isn't defined as just something for God's people. Grace can be extended and received across all sorts of ethnic boundaries. And so there's a lesson there, almost like the big brother as well. Okay, um, God chose to show grace through Esau to Jacob. Hey, Jacob, have you understood? Are you going to be a person of grace yourself? So there's another application there for us, isn't there? Yeah. Does that answer your question, Kim? Yeah. Well, let's... Oh, darn it, Pete. One, that, arm, that arm is quicker than my verbal words. Yeah, go for it, mate. <laughs> So, so we're not we're not told a lot about Jacob's internal thought processes, which is really foreign to us because we want to see them, don't we? We want a whole lot of thought bubbles uh, to help look at his heart. We're told we're told he certainly wants to be reconciled. We're told that he's fearful, and those feed into what's happening. Uh, it is no problem to become a Christian because you fear hell, but you will grow to love the God who has saved you. Okay, so I think that's kind of what's going on there. Does that answer your question? That's what you wanted. All right, I'm glad we worked that out. Whew. 